Hospital Mumbai, Dr. Tejaswini Gudibande from Naran Health City, Bangalore. Now it's a time to introduce our guest speaker for the day. We all know him very well. We are with us, Dr. Saji Kumar from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, USA. Dr. Saji Kumar is consultant in the Division of Hematology and Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic Cancer Center in Rochester, Minnesota, USA. He serves as Medical Director for the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center Clinical Research Office and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine, Mayo Clinic, US. He received his MD in Internal Medicine from Ames, New Delhi. His postdoctoral training included residency in Internal Medicine and Fellowship in Hematology and Oncology at Mayo Graduate School of Medicine, Rochester, Minnesota, USA. His research focuses on development of novel drugs for treatment of myeloma. His research team evaluates in vitro activity of novel drugs that are based on their mechanism of action and are likely to have activity in the setting of myeloma. Promising drugs are brought into the clinic through early stage clinical trials in phase one and phase two studies. He also evaluates novel combinations of different drugs to identify synergistic combinations that can result in better treatment responses and eventually better patient outcomes. His work on drug development is complemented by an active program studying in the biology of myeloma with a focus on the study of bone marrow microenvironment in multiple myeloma and how it influences the tumor cells, especially the increased bone marrow micro vessels seen in myeloma. His clinical research focuses on outcomes of patients with myeloma and amyloidosis, especially those who are high risk. He also conducts NIH-funded research on translation of novel therapeutic targets in multiple myeloma, as well as the role of cerebral pathways in myeloma. He also received funding from Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation to study the relationship between molecular profiles, treatment regimens for patients with multiple myeloma, and the outcomes. Additional research funded by NCI investigate the prevalence, onset, and the biomarkers for progression of monoclonal gammopathies. He is also on editorial advisory board, the Lancet Hematology 2014 till present, Clinical Oncology News 2011 till present, Advances in Therapy General from 2009 till present, American Journal of Hematology from 2009 to 2011. He is also an associate editor of American Journal of Hematology from 2011 till present. He is a board member of European Journal of Clinical and Medical Oncology from 2011 till present, Leukemia Journal from 2010 till present. He is also the member of Institutional Review Board of Mayo Clinic from 2009 till present. And today he is with us to update us in myeloma from ASH in December 2023. Well, thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Shaji Kumar. Thank you, Amit, and good evening, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, so it's it. Um, is that visible? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, is this full screen? No, no, no. It is not full screen. Yeah. I think yeah, you have to make it a full screen, sir. It is full screen right now on mine at least. No. Uh, we are able to visit between smaller version, sir. I think. Oh, the... that's probably because I have a very wide screen. Um, okay. So. If I do it this way, is it better then? I can do it as. Uh... Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Oh, Let's sorry, do it this way. Because my. Screen. Yeah. This will be yeah, better. Because it's a very wide screen. So it's probably getting kind of squished in between, so. Okay, I'll uh, just use it uh, this way. So good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna just go over some of the, I think um, the abstracts that have more implications on how we take care of patients with monoclonal gammopathies, uh, particularly multiple myeloma. And I think we have to put these uh, new findings in the context of how we treat the disease and especially highlight some of the um, you know, the emphasis that has been placed on the management of early phase disease, particularly high-risk monitoring myeloma, and the importance of accurate diagnosis uh, and uh, early risk stratification and treatment, risk-adapted approaches uh, in treatment of myeloma. What is very clear also is that um, while the treatments have kind of improved quite a bit and patients are living a lot longer than they used to uh, two decades ago, 
much work that still needs to be done, uh, particularly in terms of um, not only expanding the duration for which patients' first remission lasts, but also uh, coming up with new therapeutic modalities to take care of the subsequent relapses that inevitably follows that initial uh, response. And patients, you know, nowadays still get to be highly refractory um, um, uh, towards the end of their uh, disease course. So let's start off from the beginning, uh, talking about some of the precursor conditions, particularly uh, the monoclonal tomopathy of undetermined significance and um, uh, multiple and small brain multiple myeloma. So um, there were, you know, many of you are familiar with the um, ISTOP MM study that is being done in uh, Iceland, where they are screening essentially the entire population that's over fifty and demonstrating, um, and again, looking at the prevalence of these precursor conditions and also defining the natural history, disease associations, uh, as well as the um, the impact of early intervention. So this is, you know, again, a fairly large study with about 75,000 participants and patients are being followed, uh, randomized to different arms uh, that determines the intensity of the initial evaluation and the subsequent follow-up. But what is more relevant for this particular uh, ASH was the uh, their e evaluation of the normal free light normal range for the free light chains uh, levels and free light chain ratio. They had previously demonstrated um, again in, you had to remember that the original normal range for free light chain assay was um, defined based on a cohort of you know three hundred patients. Um, the two things have changed. One thing has changed since then, which is this the changes in the performance of this assay and some drip that we have seen over the years. So a more current data, especially based on a very large population, is of uh, great value. So previously, they had demonstrated that as the renal function decreases, um, the free light chain ratio um, uh, that we now can increase, and they have been able to define the appropriate cutoffs in the spatial population. More recently, the presentation at ASH, they looked at people with normal renal function, but again, um, grouping them into two um, based on the age. And you can see here in uh, patients or sorry, normal individuals under 70, the normal free light chain ratio that they defined in the population is 0 0.44 to 2.16. Whereas currently what we use in the clinic is 0 0.26 to 1.65. So clearly a bit higher. Um, now, what are the implications of this? The main impact of this is going to be in two areas. One is in the diagnosis of light chain muggers. So because currently we define light chain muggers as those individuals with uh, no uh, detectable heavy light chain, heavy chain, and a light chain ratio that is abnormal and an involved light chain that is uh, beyond the abnormal um, value. Now, using the new definition with a cutoff of 3.15, they were able to def um, define the prevalence of light chain muggers as 0.26% versus the previous definition of 1.54%. So clearly, um, you know, we are now we are saying almost a one-sixth of the people really have light chain muggers. And with a limited follow-up, they're able to show that these are in, in fact the people who actually progress, whereas those people with their, uh, who don't have light chain muggers by the new definition, as you can see with the yellow line has almost no progression events, at least for the six years. So it's clear that, you know, we've been over-diagnosing light chain markers using this uh, test over the years. So this study is important in terms of defining what numbers we should be using. The next uh, area that is of great interest has been the, the whole concept of um, early intervention in patients with small ring multiple myeloma. So we have been using the Mayo 20 to 20 score uh, for defining patients with high risk. And we know those people with at least two of those high risk characteristics uh, have a risk of progression of close to 50% at two years. Now, we also know from our own practice, a lot of these patients might be low risk, but over the next year that we've been following them, that um, their numbers can actually change. And that usually is a harbinger of uh, disease progression. And this is a concept of evolving small ring myeloma that has been around for a while and multiple groups have shown that. And we have another study from the ASH again demonstrating that an increase in the M protein of more than 0.4 gram per deciliter during the first year or a free light chain ratio increase of more than 40% is a predictor of um, uh, short time to progression to active myeloma 
And in fact, when you look at the adding that characteristics to the 20 to 20 criteria, it is helpful, particularly in those patients who are considered to be standard risk at the time of small ring myeloma diagnosis, as you can see from the left hand most uh, curve. Within that individual, uh, within that group, uh, you can see that the individuals who have an evolving phenotype, they have a very high risk of progression, uh, almost um, a 50% risk of progression in about um, five years or so. So bringing those group again closer to that uh, definition of high risk small ring myeloma. Now, obviously, there has been a lot of interest and in the whole concept of risk stratification has taken on more um, value because now we are starting to intervene in these patients. We have two randomized phase two, three trials that have shown that use of lenalidomide with or without dexamethasone can improve the time to progression and also the overall survival of patients with high risk small ring myeloma. Now, the question that always comes up is, what if we were to treat them with really intense therapies uh, instead of just using lenalidomide alone, are we actually able to uh, improve their outcomes? And this is a long-term um, data from the clinical trial using KRD induction for eight cycles followed by lenalidomide maintenance for two years. Last batch, we saw the results from both the ASCEN trial as well as from the CSER um, trials. And this one is a bit different. It's only a triplet. But the long-term data shows two important things. One, you can get deep responses. A significant proportion of patients are MRD negative. Two, the people who are MRD negative actually have can take a long time to progress. In fact, the MRD negativity was sustained over two years in almost 39% of these patients. And most importantly, um, you can see that the progression to symptomatic myeloma was seen in only about 10% of patients <clears throat> with a median follow-up of almost five years. So again, is KRD the right regimen to use? We don't know the answer to that question, but it does demonstrate that even in patients with high risk small ring myeloma, using a high intense therapy to bring the clone down to very low levels can be associated with uh, um, a, a significant delay in time to progression to myeloma, which we hope will translate to better overall survival. Now, there is, uh, you know, this is a very small study, again, exploring the different therapeutic options for patients with small ring myeloma. <clears throat> As you all know, the bispecific antibodies have been quite effective in relapsed disease. And this is a very small trial that looked at using teclistimab, which is a BCMA-targeted um, bispecific antibody uh, in patients um, with uh, high risk small ring myeloma. Just 12 patients or too early, but you don't see the cytokine release syndrome was seen in about 58%. No uh, I, neurological toxicity. So overall, the toxicity profile for those bispecific um, uh, related toxicity seemed to be low. Again, not a lot of infections, but remember these are patients who are previously never been treated, very healthy patients, and we have short follow-up. So we need to wait for uh, some more time before we are sure about this. But uh, the response rates are really good. Um, you know, it seems to be MRD negativity in nearly all the patients who actually went on treatment. So, you know, I think we're going to start seeing the um, many of these newer therapies employed in this early phase of the disease. Uh, to get a better sense of whether we can cure some of these patients by catching them early. Now, um, as I previously mentioned, the risk stratification is clearly very important, and we continue to uncover new uh, important prognostic factors in this disease. And one of them that has been around for a long time has been the presence of circulating tumor cells. What has changed is that now we have flow cytometry, um, which is highly sensitive and can detect extremely small levels or low levels of circulating tumor cells. With that kind of sensitivity, you can see that the majority of the myeloma patients, you can actually uh, detect um, a circulating tumor cells at diagnosis, almost 90% of these people. And not only can we detect them, we can also show that the uh, increasing numbers of um, circulating tumor cells are associated with uh, uh, decreased progression and overall survival. Um, uh, at this point in time. And not only do the, um, uh, it, it also seems to be quite independent of the other conventional uh, risk factors that we use, including the high-risk fish as well as the ISS staging system. So clearly, you know, um, this is something we think in the future is more, more and more likely to be uh, incorporated into the risk stratification systems of patients with uh, uh, multiple myeloma. Now, um, you know, why are we so worried about the high risk? Because these patients don't do very well. You know, these are the patients who often relapse very early. 
um, and um, often become refractory to all the available agents in a very rapid manner. So the, uh, pay, the, the UK investigators actually did a very interesting analysis from their optimum trial, which was uh, included in, which was basically high-risk patients going on a very intense therapy. And they specifically tried to see who are those people, patients who are, um, you know, even you can see that the optimum trial regimen of DARA CRBD was associated with one of the best outcomes that we have seen in high-risk myeloma compared to some of the previous regimens. 77% uh, progression free at 30 months. But the problem is what about the other 23% who actually do relapse very early? What is unique about them? Are there things that we don't know um, um, based on the, you know, the current risk stratification systems? So they basically looked at those patients and tried to identify what is um, uh, the uh, enriched in those early patient population. And two things really stood out, which is the 17P deletion and people with multiple high-risk abnormalities. And this is, again, you know, nothing new. We knew these are the patients who do, do very well. But it's very interesting when you look at in a cohort of otherwise high-risk patients, these are the two factors that really stand out, suggesting that these are the groups we really need to do something quite different than even what has been employed in the uh, optimum trial. So now switching gears, um, you know, talking about newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, um, you know, there was the Perseus trial, which was clearly um, a very, um, you know, results that have been um, much anticipated. And this is a randomized phase three trial that randomized patients with newly diagnosed transplant eligible myeloma uh, to either getting botosomib lentex, our current standard, or diratimumab botosomib lentex, DRBD. Four cycles injection, transplant, single transplant, two cycle consolidation, and then maintenance with either LEN or Dara LEN. And in the data LEN, um, um, patients who are uh, MRD negative after two years could discontinue the diratimumab. But again, no randomization there. Um, we already had the Griffin trial previously showing that the um, patients receiving data BRD did better with PFS. Um, and here again, in the newly diagnosed patient population, you still see um, very similar results to the uh, Griffin trial. Overall response rates, particularly complete response rate, was about 17% higher with the addition of diratimumab, and it seemed to benefit all the different patient subgroups that were looked at, irrespective of age, gender, uh, cytogenetics, and so forth. When you look at the MRD negativity, again, whether you look at minus 5 cutoff or a minus 6 cutoff, you can see that the diratimumab did improve the MRD negativity rate, almost double the minus 6 rate, and also actually double the uh, proportion of patients who remained in MRD negative for more than 12 months. And all these improvements did translate to better PFS. So at uh, four years, you can see that the, there's a 17% improvement in the PFS um, uh, for the um, uh, DARA RBD compared to RBD. And importantly, when you look at the subgroup analysis, you can see that the majority of the patient, all the patients benefited with a very striking exception of patients over 65. And this brings up very important questions. Of course, these are transplant eligible patients. Nevertheless, the older patients among the transplant eligible did not appear to have um, as much um, benefit um, with the data RBD compared to RBD. And it's a sizable patient population, as you can see here, um, that is almost 25% uh, 20, you know, of these patients who are enrolled on the clinical trial. So that is an important question that needs to be looked at in other contexts as we'll come to in a second. Now, at the current follow-up, there is no difference in the overall survival as we saw with the Griffin trial as well. So clearly, you know, there are questions um, that are still unanswered as to whether we should be using a four-drug regimen in every patient or should it be used in a more selective manner given the lack of this. Now, another um, important question that did not get answered with the Perseus trial is whether we need ratimumab as part of maintenance therapy. Remember, there was no second randomization. The previous trial, the Cassiopeia trial that used thalidomide instead of lenalidomide, there was indeed a second randomization that randomized patients to ratimumab versus observation for maintenance. And that trial was very important in demonstrating that patients who got ratimumab as part of injection therapy did not benefit from getting a maintenance regimen. So I think that it's unclear whether we need direct map maintenance if you go direct map as part of induction therapy. Now, in terms of toxicity, um, the Perseus trial did demonstrate that there was some increase in the 
um, hematological toxicity and also some increase in infections with the four drug regimen compared to the uh, three drug regimen. Now, if so, important questions that have not been answered by Perseus trial. One, do we need the teratumumab maintenance? Um, is, it, is it applicable to everyone? Um, especially in the US uh, setting, is it applicable to the African-American patient population? And third, um, is it applicable to the older patients? At least subgroup analysis suggests the, it may not work as well for the older patients. So there was data from the Emory group They looked at their own experience of using DARA RBD versus RBD. These are not a randomized trial. These are sequential patients over years as they switch their standard approach. But what is important with their trial is that they had no DARA-based maintenance and their maintenance approach was in fact a risk stratified approach using a PI emit for high risk and then alone for standard risk, which is what we currently use. And what is important was nearly 40% of those patients are African-Americans compared to maybe 8% or so in many of the phase three trials. Now, obviously um, uh, what they were able to show was um, um, let me just that the progression-free survival and the overall survival um, was um, you know better with the four drug than the uh, um, three drug regimen, but again very limited follow up. So it's important for us to come uh, compare this with what happened with the uh, Griffin and Perseus at those time points. So when you look at the four year progression free survival, you can see that the um, Griffin, Perseus, and the Emory experience all show about an eighty five percent four year PFS in newly diagnosed patients undergoing an autologous stem cell transplant. So again suggesting that you know maybe the direct map maintenance that was used in the Perseus and Griffin maybe is not needed because it didn't seem to make any difference uh, in the setting of at least what the uh, Emory experience has been. So um, what about... Um, so there was also another trial that looked at uh, isetaximab instead of daratimumab and carfilzomib instead of botasimib as the other quadruplet for patients with newly diagnosed patients, very similar design. Um, and But what they were looking at as a primary endpoint was the MRD negativity. And as you can see here that the addition of, or the using the quadruplet, uh, the addition of the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody to the KRD regimen did lead to a better uh, MRD negativity. Whether this will translate to a better PFS, uh, we will only, you know, we will know later. Now, going back to that question about the older patients, do we really need a quadruplet? I think there's some information you can gain from this uh, uh, Spanish trial. It's a very small trial, only about 40 odd patients in each arm, but they randomized them to a conventional melphalan based regimen, BMP followed by RD, or a KRD triplet or a DARA KRD quadruplet. What they were able to show was clearly the KRD and the DARA KRD was associated with a much better MRD negativity rate and was also associated with a better progression-free survival um, compared to just using the traditional melphalan-based regimen. But what was important was that there was no difference between DARA KRD and KRD, and there was in fact more discontinuation for toxicity in the, um, and toxicity-related death in the DARA KRD arm. Again, substantiating what we saw with the Perseus trial that patients over 65 may not necessarily benefit from getting a quadruplet regimen at least in the in, in, in the standard risk patients. Now, um, kind of switching gears here a little bit, now let's talk a little bit about the relapsed multiple myeloma, where clearly there have been a lot of um, advances in the um, uh, recent uh, years, particularly with respect to the immunotherapy, uh, the CAR T cells and the bispecific antibodies. So there were a lot of smaller trial updates about phase one studies, very small cohort studies looking at uh, uh, role of the newer bispecifics as well as newer um, CAR Ts, but I'm going to focus primarily on the real world experience because that is what you know what we're going to be seeing in the clinic. So it is important uh, this clinical trial or the study that was done uh, from the um, uh, CABMTR um, where they looked at the real world outcomes with uh, IDASL. Now, so you know the IDASL is a BCMA targeted CAR T that has been approved for use in the US. So they looked at about 821 patients uh, who um, were treated with IDASL a standard of care. So that means these are patients with at least four prior lines of therapy. When you look at the cohort, you can see that this is again, includes a lot of older patients. Nearly a third of the patients are over 70. It's a very important question as we always talk about, you know, can we actually use it in the older patients? 
uh, you can see that there's many of these patients had significant comorbidities, many of these patients had high risk disease. Um, they were all exposed to uh, multiple drugs. In fact, uh, many of them were even exposed to BCMA targeted agents. Um, what was seen was the overall response rate was about 73%, maybe about 10, 15% less than what was seen in the um, Karma trial, um, uh, Karma 1 trial. Um, and you can see that the response rates appear to be quite similar across the board, maybe a little bit less for those patients with uh, stage 3 ISS and patients with prior BCMA therapy. When you look at the progression-free survival, the median PFS was nine months, which is not too far from what was seen in the KARMA-1 trial, and the median overall survival was not reached. And when you look at the factors that influence these outcomes, both progression-free survival and the overall survival, you can see that those patients who, um, again, had a low platelet count at the time of therapy, had previously seen a BCMA-targeted agent uh, in the near uh, past, high cytogenetic risk, ISS stage 3, heavy tumor burden, extramolar disease, all this was associated with uh, a poor performance status was all associated with the inferior progression-free survival. Similarly, when you look at the overall survival, you see the same factors falling out, poor performance status, um, thrombocytopenia, recent exposure to BCMA-targeted agents, um, high-risk um, cytogenetics, um, and also patients with uh, extra or ele elevated LDH. So what about the safety? You know, clearly in the clinical trial setting, you often um, um, have a very different profile when you look at the toxicity. Here you can see that the overall CRS rate was about 80%, very similar to the um, uh, clinical trial uh, information. The ICANS was about 28%, but grade three was only about 5%. One of the biggest concerns that we have with CAR-T uh, the, is the presence of significant infections. And you can see here, um, there were quite a few um, uh, patients with a variety of different infections. And more recently, as you have heard, there have been concerns with T-cell malignancies, though none was reported in this cohort. You know, we have seen uh, 20 to 30 patients uh, reported so far um, across all the different CAR-T cells, uh, therapies for lymphoma and myeloma. So something to um, that I think we will learn more as we go along. So how does it fare, the real-world data, in comparison to what we saw um, uh, in the clinical trials? On the left-hand side is the current cohort. You can see the KARMA trial with 128 patients and a previous U.S. real-world experience uh, with about 159 patients. Same, similar data, nine-month PFS, 70 to 80% overall response rate. Um, and again, um, you know, so essentially what we've seen both in terms of toxicity and efficacy in the real world setting seems to be quite similar to uh, what we saw in the clinical trials. Now, there's not very large cohorts out there with using silta cell in the real world, but you know, um, in the at least in the phase one trials, silta cell was associated with almost a three year progression free survival. So clearly we need to wait and see what that uh, shows. Now, the other immunotherapy that has been approved and is being uh, used quite a bit in the clinic today is teclistamab. This is the BCMA targeted by specific antibody. And again, looking at a real-world experience of about 106 patients, comparing that to Majestic 1, that was the pivotal trial that led to uh, the approval of teclistamab. You can see that you know this is a cohort that is very different, right? These are Patients with poor performance status, a lot of high-risk cytogenetics, extramolar disease in almost 42% of these patients. And most importantly, uh, 88 of those 106 patients would not have been eligible for the clinical trial at all due to a variety of different exclusion factors. So a much more sick, sicker patient population. And what, we, what was seen in these uh, patients was that the overall response rate was roughly the same, about 60% 60 or so. Uh, deep responses may be not as much. Um, and when you look at the different subgroups of interest, you can see that there is similar response rate across the board, maybe with the exception of those patients with uh, RISS stage 3 and patients with extramolar disease. Neither of these patients uh, seem to get um, uh, a high rate of uh, response with the clustermab. When you look at the survival outcomes, again, one thing to remember is the median follow-up is very short for this study. The median PFS was noted to be only about 5.4 months, which is almost half of what we saw in the Majestic 1 trial. And the median overall survival was not uh, reached in this cohort. When you look at the safety profile, you can see that these are patients um, 
Again, the CRS rate predominantly grade one or two, um, which is what we see in the clinic. Um, even with the clinical trials, ICANS very low rate, only 3% grade three or four. Um, and when you look at the hematological toxicity, you do get quite a fair amount of leukopenia and some delayed cytopenia, so prolonged cytopenia. So you can see uh, almost grade three for leukopenia and 7% of those patients at day 90. Now, from an infection perspective, this is something of great interest because we have seen quite a bit of unusual infections amongst patients who are getting bispecific antibodies. And here, as with the clinical trial, we can see that maybe even more so, 46% of these patients uh, with severe infections compared to about 35% in the uh, phase one trials. So this is something that we have to continue to work on. And a lot of the work that's going on right now is looking at limited duration therapy or reduced fre frequency of administration to try and see if we can improve upon this. Now, um, so what is the, that the whole bispecific antibody field moving? Um, the two important approach or three approaches. One is time-limited therapy. Two, reduce frequency of administration that is probably driven by the depth of response. And the third thing is looking at combinations with standard of care agents. So we saw some interesting data with talcutamab, which is the GPRC 5D targeted by specific antibody in combination with pomalidomide. And we saw that the talcutamab plus pomalidomide, the overall response rate was real, uh, nearly 94%. Um, obviously, high response rate even amongst those patients who have been previously exposed to BCMA targeted agents. In terms of toxicity, it's important to note that there was no additional toxicity that we saw here that wasn't seen with uh, either of these individual drugs. And I think this is a paradigm that is increasingly being explored even in the newly diagnosed setting. We have teclistamab with ratumumab, teclistamab with lenalidomide trials that are ongoing uh, in the um, newly diagnosed patient uh, setting. Now, I think I, um, just one abstract that I think is very important um, from the point of view of uh, routine practice, you know, most of us have started using the um, bortezomib once weekly instead of twice weekly, sub-Q instead of IV based on some of the um, phase three data as well as retrospective data. And this is actually a very large cohort of patients who are identified from um, the existing databases. These are almost 2000 patients, um, almost 40% um, of them actually getting uh, twice weekly compared to once weekly in about 1600 patients. You can see that there's fairly similar group of patient population, but when you look at the real world progression-free survival, no difference at all between the two, once weekly versus twice weekly. There was no difference in the overall survival. However, there was definitely less peripheral neuropathy associated with once weekly, almost half as much compared to the twice weekly. And again, highlighting and reiterating the fact that we should not be using twice weekly uh, bortezomib for any patient uh, in the current practice. Finally, uh, to wrap up, I just want to talk about a little bit about light chain amyloidosis. We did see, um, uh, we know that the Andromeda trial um, did look at the Directumumab BCD regimen, demonstrated a better um, survival endpoint and better hematologic response uh, with Dara B, uh, BCD versus um, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone. One of the problems with the Andromeda trial was they had excluded the stage 3B patients with light chain amyloidosis. Uh, these are the, the predominantly the patients with advanced cardiac involvement. And this EMN trial looked at using daratumumab as a single agent uh, in this patient population. And after four cycles, three cycles, if they did not have a partial response with improvement in organ response, then uh, botasumib and low dose dexamethasone was added. With this approach, you can see that the major um, the overall survival, um, the median overall survival was a little less than a year. But again, this is better than what we have seen in the stage 3B patients with the previous approaches. And when you look at the secondary endpoints, you can see that hematologic response are pretty decent, not maybe quite as high as what we saw with the Andromeda trial. Um, but again, you are seeing meaningful hematologic response as well as organ responses. So I think um, you know, some of the important takeaway points from the uh, ASH 2023 includes, again, the implementation of the new free light chain ratio values in your routine practice, um, ensuring that you monitor the small ring myeloma patients very closely after diagnosis to identify the subgroup of patients who are evolving. I think uh, today, based on the data we have, I think the high risk small ring myeloma patients, uh, sorry, high risk um, myeloma, small ring myeloma patients do merit some form of intervention, preferably in the context of a clinical trial. I think quadruplet regimens, including the CD38, is probably can be considered as the um, 
uh, preferred initial therapy for patients going to an autologous stem cell transplant. There's clearly no proven role for daratumumab maintenance post autologous stem cell transplant today. High risk patients should receive botasumib or carfilzomib with lenalidomide as maintenance therapy. And in fact, for patients over 65, I think it's reasonable to say that we should just continue to use triplets. Um, and I think that a, a daratumumab lendex triplet would be a reasonable approach um, in those patients who are not going to a stem cell transplant. Um, and um, and then finally, obviously, immunotherapies are so exciting, and I think we'll continue to see them being explored in the early lines of therapy. And patients with advanced light chain amyloidosis, daratumumab should be the go-to drug to start them with, and then you can always add um, botasumib to that if need be. With that, I'll stop and uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a fantastic talk. It was wonderful, as always. I request all of our discussions to please put the raise in sign so that we can start our question and answer session with Dr. Sajji Kumar. So, uh, I have a question. Uh, in amyloidosis, is there a place for DARA maintenance? Not really. I mean, you know, the main, if you look at the Andromeda trial, that was also a limited duration. So it depends on how you um, define maintenance because six cycles of DARA VCD and then Teratumumab was continued for an additional 18 months. So which is our current practice that giving the DARA up to two years. But there's important, um, you know, unanswered questions as to whether we really need that maintenance, especially when you're dealing with uh, disease like elagine amyloidosis with a relatively indolent clone. Um, whether we need continued therapy. So we are doing a pragmatic trial um, where we are actually randomizing patients to limited duration DARA versus uh, two years. Um, it's quite possible that those patients who are more myeloma-like with more than 10% plasma cells, there may be a role for continued maintenance, but the others, it's unclear. I, especially in the lower clone burden, you can always you know, stop therapy after a year. That is what I often do. And then watch them closely and restart therapy if something were to start evolving again. And what then is the place of autologous transplant in AN amyloid? So, you know, it's um, we are doing less and less of it. I think with the DARA VCD regimen, um, clearly these patients have very early onset hematologic response. They have uh, good organ response. So I think the transplant right now where we end up doing them uh, is the, the transplant eligible patients who don't get a deep heme response with these therapies up front. Um, those patients, we tend to take them to an early transplant. The rest of them, we often collect and sometimes we store. But you can also make an argument that you really don't need to collect and store because these patients are getting limited duration therapy. And if they're going to need um, a subsequent therapy five, six years later, you can collect at that time rather than just you know um, have collect and store. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Nitin Gupta, your question, please. Hello, hi, good evening, and uh, thank you, Shazi, for uh, the excellent talk and update on ASH updates. Um, again, so many of the newer therapies are not available to us or maybe coming in near future. But uh, do you see uh, uh, any role of allogenic transplant in younger patients of uh, relapsed multiple myeloma, especially who uh, relapse after autologous transplant? Is there any role in current era? Absolutely. I think there is clearly a role for a very, very small subset of patients. So if you look at that UK high-risk trial, right, that 21% who relapsed within the first uh, couple of years, those patients are not going to do well, whatever you do for them. Um, you know, these are the ones with the 17P deletion with often with a 1Q abnormality and a 414 or a 1416 translocation. So if you have a high-risk translocation, a 1Q abnormality and a 17P deletion, Whatever all the therapies we have available today is not going to keep them going beyond maybe two or three years. So I think those patients, it's reasonable to consider allogeneic transplant. Question that always comes up is should you think about it in the frontline setting? I don't do that typically because you know these risk stratification systems are not perfect. You know, we always have patients who look high risk and they continue to behave very well afterwards. So we don't want to subject them to something that is toxic without kind of uh, testing the waters. So what I do is, you know, take them to an early transplant, give them two drug maintenance, and if they relapse early, then I plan to take them to an allogenic transplant at the best response to the second line therapy. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin Gupta. Dr. Bowser, your question, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shaji, for an excellent review. 
Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is uh, use of teclistamab uh, given the high infection rate in this uh, real world study and the earlier study. So what prophylaxis you re recommend and uh, how about IVIgG replacement? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, we put all of them on PJP prophylaxis routinely as well as um, zoster prophylaxis. That's fairly routine. Some of those older patients, um, poor performance, that is recent infections, we also put them on some fluoroquinolone prophylaxis at least for the first a uh, couple of months until the myeloma comes under control. IVIG, we routinely give them IVIG if their IV, uh, the IgG is less than 400. So that is uh, our current practice. Um, we tend to, in you know, the text, we tend to uh, you know, switch over to every other week or every month as soon as they get to a deep response. So many of our patients go to a reduced schedule by four to six, fourth to sixth a month. And maybe I missed it, but there was aspergillosis and some candida, so antifungal prophylaxis? Not routinely. Unless they're neutropenic, we don't. Okay, all right. And the second thing is use of uh, venetoclax. And I know we get a couple of patients where we don't have any options, and either they are 11, 14, or diesel too high. So, and uh, given the excess uh, death rates uh, in the Bellini trial, uh, uh, if we one wants to use, uh, what would be your recommendation or what precautions you want to take? Right. So we do use a fair amount of venetoclax off-label in the 11-14 patients. So I would only do it in 11-14 patients, not the quote-unquote BCL too high, because we don't have a validated clinical test that can accurately you know, group those patients using the BCL2 expression at this point. So 11-14 patients, I never go over 400 milligrams of venetoclax. Start at 200, if they tolerate well, maybe 400 max. Always use it in combination, preferably with uh, uh, diratumumab. Uh, or in um, patients who are uh, you know, refracted to DARA, often with carfilzomib, um, and then always with dexamethasone, um, usually 20 milligrams weekly, but you know it can be anywhere from 20 to 40 milligrams weekly. Uh, and yeah. prophylaxis-wise, we put them on um, antibiotic prophylaxis, so quinolones usually for the first three months until disease control, and then um, also on acyclovir for zoster prophylaxis, IVIG replacement for low IgGs. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your opinion on that uh, uh, paper on B-cell uh, signature and uh, uh, this uh, patient having B-cell uh, markers and the uh, blood paper where they showed, uh, they have given the score to be calculated and uh, predicting sensitive to venetoclax? Yeah, so, totally. I mean, there's no question that the high B-cell, you know, the more and more B-cell-like they are, the more B-cell they have and the more likely they are to respond. The problem is your specificity of your test becomes less and less as you go towards that end of the spectrum. So there is, you know, your, your likelihood that you're going to give a treatment that's going to be no benefit and potentially harmful goes up as you, you know, because the BCL2 staining can be very subjective. Um, what, we, what is being developed as a biomarker is a droplet P, uh, PCR um, for uh, quantification of the BCL2 uh, gene expression. Once that test becomes e easily available, um, I think we will expand the BCL2 inhibit inhibitor eligible patients from the current 20%, 11-14 to probably about 40% of the patient population, um, bringing in those BCL2 high patients. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. yeah, hi, sir. This is uh, Dr. Pawan. So uh, I have one specific question related to amyloidosis. So those patients who have, take, who have been taken upfront for autologous transplant, so do you recommend uh, maintenance therapy and what kind of maintenance therapy and for how long? We typically don't do maintenance therapy after the um, amyloid autotransplant. The only place where we tend to do that are those patients who presented with more like myeloma-like features, a lot of plasmacytosis, high, high uh, proliferation rate and uh, high risk cytogenetics. Those patients, we do tend to put them on maintenance and they often just continue them on the um, bortezomib as maintenance. Um, uh, in that setting, no, I, I, I just wondered, I, I, I because I had uh, one patient who presented with forty gram proteinuria per day. So mm -hmm. these kind of patients have very high proteinuria. So in these, so do we just rely on the melphalan as a single dose, two hundred with what is given, or it depends to put on some, some yeah, it depends on the response because everything hinges on whether you are going to get a hematologic response. So if your auto transplant didn't put them into a complete response hematologically. Um, then you probably need additional therapy to bring it down. Unless you can get the light chance to normalize, it's unlikely that the proteinuria is going to improve. Um, and the other thing is the proteinuria could take up to you know year and a half to two years to improve, uh, even after you get a hematologic complete response. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pawan Singh. Dr. Chandrakar, ma'am, your question, please. Yeah. Thank you for a fantastic lecture. This is regarding MRD, measurable residual disease. Uh, in a practical routine uh, uh, treatment, when should we use? We should use marrow or a peripheral blood, flow or a molecular. What is the ideal thing? And how should we change the management of treatment decisions on based on the MRD? Right. I think, the, you know, the MRD, as we know, is um, the first question is, should we do it in the bone marrow or should we do it in the blood? The blood is about a log less sensitive. So I wouldn't rely on um, that being the that the MRD test, but can we use the peripheral blood um, as a way to um, decide when to do the bone marrow? I think that's reasonable. But I don't know if necessarily you know mass spectrometry based protein testing is um, might be equivalent to actually doing peripheral blood circulating tumor DNA or circulating cells. Um, but from a um, current practice, the MRD is um, based on the bone marrow. Now we have flow, we have um, next generation sequencing. The next, the next generation sequencing uh, does have the sensitivity of minus six. With the flow, you can get to minus six if you can get 10 million events. Um, so between the failure rate of the NGS and the um, not getting 10 million events in the flow, we probably end up being only able to do 85% of the patients accurately. Now, in terms of what do we do with the information, it's mostly prognostic. Um, it is not purely actionable, except in two two scenarios, at least in my, my own practice. One is patients with high-risk disease. If they are still MRD positive, then I try to give them more intensification. Two patients who are on maintenance, who have been on maintenance for a long time, and are starting to have side effects if they are MRD negative, I take them off maintenance. Thank you. So the other question is, uh, patient has got a amyloidosis and tongue hypertrophy, not able to swallow anything, like such anything. And uh, post uh, like uh, two months, like weekly two months, and patient still has difficulty in swallowing. So do we consider this as non-responsive or should we continue? How long we should continue before we discontinue DARA in this patient? Right. I would, at two months of uh, therapy, I would just focus on the hematologic response. So if the patient is having a hematologic response, I would continue with the therapy because the macroglossy and other things can change, can take a long time to resolve. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Aditi Shah? You are muted, Dr. Aditi. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you, sir. It was a very nice talk. So my first question is in a patient who has high risk based on MSMART, like two mutations like deletion 13, amplification 1Q or translocation 14, uh, uh, but not deletion 17P. And clinically, they don't present like a high risk disease, uh, probably only anemia. Then uh, do you still consider giving DARA upfront or we can start with three drug? Yeah, so I think you know, the um, monosomy 13 is no longer considered a high risk. So it's only the uh, 414. And again, you know, there's going to be an updated uh, risk definition that's going to be coming out later this year. Well, 414 alone is, is again, no longer considered to be a high risk. You really need to have a second abnormality with it. So any of the translocations have to be paired with another abnormality to call them high risk. Uh, 1Q amplification is high risk and 17P deletion is high risk. So if any of those conditions... Uh, definitely a four drug regimen uh, would okay. be appropriate um, in any of the settings. But, you know, I think increasingly what we are doing is um, for the transplant patients, I think um, the first four cycles of injection therapy, people are increasingly using map even in the U.S. practice. Well, you know, it's unclear at this point whether everybody needs it or not. So I think if you, if you cannot give the four drugs, I think three drugs is still a very reasonable regimen pre-transplant. Thank you, sir. And second question is actually a case scenario. Patient is 68-year-old, past history of CABG. Currently, uh, ejection fraction is all right. And known case of CKD uh, and presented with a creat of 7. Now, after three cycles of daratumumab, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone, he is in complete remission. Bone marrow plasma cells are less than 5%. MRD is not done. So, ECOG performance status-wise, he is good. Uh, age and known cardiac comorbidity and creat now is stable at 1.8, 1.9. So uh, considering uh, transplant in this patient and if not transplant, then for how long to give DARA maintenance? 
You know, I would definitely consider the auto transplant. I mean, it looks like this is a patient who can certainly be taken safely through transplant. So I would consider that as a first option. If you don't go to a transplant, then, you know, then um, you have two choices. Um, you could either just uh, collect and store if you're thinking of transplant later, but otherwise, um, you either you continue with the Dara LEN, um, just like what we, what was done for the Maya study, or you can use the Dara RVD for about nine cycles and then go to a, um, you know, R or a VR maintenance based on whatever the underlying cytogenetics was. So Dara for at least eight cycles and now like monthly Dara because right. weekly Dara is done for three right. months. Right. Okay. And was the, right. the patient high risk to start with? Other than he was high one? risk with two, uh, as I said, translocation 414 okay. and deletion 13, but not 17P or 1Q. So I would, you know, I think um, give the Dara RVD to maximum response, maybe six to nine cycles, and then go to uh, VR maintenance. That will be a lot less expensive in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Dr. Satish Kumar, your question, please. Um, Thanks, Amit. Sir, in continuation, Dr. Aditi's question, in high-risk uh, myeloma, how long do you give the VR maintenance? Sir? We give it continuously and for as long as the patients can tolerate it. Until progression or uh, Until intolerance. progression. Right. Because even with those regimens, we are still looking at maybe, you know, median of three years to disease progression. So as long as they're not getting much neuropathy, I would just stay with it. Right. So my question was actually regarding uh, uh, smoldering multiple myeloma. In clinical practice, is there any subset which you say that we have to start treatment, whether it's Lendex or anything? I think the current, the 20 to 20 high risk group of patients, I would certainly, if, you know, the, the three kind of paths these patients end up taking, we prefer to put them on a clinical trial. If they don't go on a clinical trial, we offer them Len. Um, and if they don't want to, then we just watch them very, very closely, especially those people with high light chains, because they are the ones who are likely to just show up suddenly with renal failure. So we can just closely watch and uh, decide when. It's not the preferable approach, approach, but you know, it's always a discussion with your patients. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Satish Kumar. Dr. Saurabh, you have a question, sir. I have a case. Please go ahead. Forty-eight-year-old lady who has diabetes, hypertension, presented with myeloma involving the bone marrow, submandibular lesion, plasma cytoma and head of pancreatic lesion. It was a IgG lambda and the biopsy from the submandibular region showed a plasma cell disease with CD138 positive, CD56 positive, MUM1 positive and lambda restriction. Now the MIB index was around 80%, Iber-ish was negative and CD56 was positive. So, what labeled as anaplastic bar plasma plastic plasma cytoma. So, she was did with a chop like treatment for one cycle outside our hospital. She could not tolerate the treatment and had severe mucositis. So, we put her on botezomib, len, and dex. And with four cycles, she has gone into complete response. Bone marrow, there is nothing, and the pet scan also is clear. The FLC ratio has normalized. So the thing is that the histology is looking very aggressive, but the response to treatment is like a myeloma. Okay. In such a patient, will you consider autologous stem cell transplant? If yes, should the conditioning regimen be only melphalan or it should be beam, which is used in a standard lymphoma? And if okay. you think that the auto transplant may not work in such aggressive disease, Will a DARA type treatment with long term maintenance is a better option? No, I would actually just do an auto transplant with MEL 200 and then put the patient on a bottom implant maintenance. Okay, sir. Okay, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh Pawan. Dr. Asha Shaman, your question, please. Thank you, sir, for an excellent uh, talk. Uh, my question was in a patient who has got 17P deletion and treated with DARA VRD uh, induction followed by autologous transplant. Uh, what would be the preferred maintenance? Sir? I would use bortezomib blend maintenance for that patient. Okay. Uh, not DARA monthly. Not DARA blend because again, the limited data with the DARA maintenance. I mean, if the patient had significant, if has neuropathy, our practice would be to use carfilzomib instead. 
if they cannot tolerate a proteasm inhibitor, then yes, Daralan would be the next option. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Cecil Roshar, your question, please. Uh, uh, just a question uh, regarding uh, the use of uh, bortezomib versus uh, daratumumab in a patient who's got, let's say, uh, progressive glomerulonephritis, renal failure, I mean, mild renal failure, and proteinuria. Is the bortezomib better or uh, daratumumab better if you want a good renal, uh, renal uh, remission? So this is a patient with uh, elderly gentleman, yeah. progressive glomerulonephritis, progressive right. glomerulonephritis disease, immunoglobulin deposition disease. Okay, got it. Um, again, I think uh, these are the patients we used to treat them with a VCD type regimens in the past, but we tend to use more of the DARA VCD or a DARA VD combination, um, especially in the setting of renal failure. Um, so either of them, either DARA VD or VCD would be appropriate, depending upon the again the finances associated with the DARA. Yeah, but if, even if the small clone, you would use DARA or rather just bortezomib dexa. Because you know, the question is uh, the importance is my, my yeah, it's not it's not as much the size of the clone as much as how where you want to get to. Okay. Um, I think these people really need to get to a um MRD type uh, setting for them to improve the relations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So there's one question from the audience from Dr. Bhuvesh Varthanath Gauri. I think there's another hand up uh, from Dr. Ba. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ba, you have a question? You can go ahead. I will ask another question. <laughs> Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you so much for the excellent talk, sir. So basically, this was in continuation with the MRD question that was raised. Basically, I have a high-risk patient, 38-year-old lady, uh, 1Q amplification present, taken up for transplant after four cycles of quadruplet regimen, DARA VRD. She had a partial response even uh, after the four cycles and taken up for transplant. She had a VGPR after that given consolidation and was continued uh, on maintenance with DARA because her biochemical parameters still had not normalized. After we continued the DARA maintenance along with the body and LEN, she has got a complete response, but her MRD is positive here now. So right now, what do we continue? So do we intensify here? Because as we know, MRD is indicator of the deep, deeper response and considering a high risk uh, status, how do we go ahead right now? And you said it's just one Q gain? Yes, sir. One Q gain. She's 38 year old. Okay. Now, I think uh, I wouldn't change treatment. I would just continue with the maintenance right now. Okay. Uh, considering that following up, probably she may turn negative is what? Or should I wait for the... I wouldn't, you know, I think the I wouldn't necessarily chase the MRD in this patient because it's again isolated one Q gain. Uh, looks like he's pretty close to that. Um, you know, we, I'm assuming close to it's a CR, but not MRD negative. So yes, I would just, yes, continue, yeah, I would just continue okay. with the comments. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. So, sir, there's one question uh, from the audience. I have a question yeah. here. So, yeah, uh, I think the uh, CTDNA, the role of CTDNA and MRD has been uh, quite established. So, I have a question. What is the role of CTC in uh, hematological malignancies, uh, particularly in multiple myeloma. Thank you. So right now, there is no proven role for uh, circulating tumor cells. It's all within the research realm. Nothing, not no applicability in the um, clinical practice yet because, you know, there's no, obviously, plasma cell leukemia definition, um, you, you know, it's changed a little bit. So from, unless it hits that threshold, uh, we are not really using it on a routine basis. Thank you. Sir, is to leave fast. So this is the last question from the audience. And from Dr. Bhuvesh Vandath Gauri, would increasing burden of circulating tumor cells in myeloma have any prognostic implication of further efficacy of anti-CD38 therapy as CD38 is a cell addition molecule? I'm sorry, um, can you repeat that? So would increasing burden of circulating tumor cells in myeloma have any prognostic implication on further efficacy of anti-CD38 therapy as CD38 is a cell addition molecule? So CD38 actually is not a cell addition molecule. Um, it's, uh, its function is not very clear. But yeah, irrespective of that, you know, the circulating tumor cells is a poor prognostic marker. And But in terms of therapy, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, it's uniformly present in the myeloma cells. It's very, very uncommon to see uh, myeloma cells without a CD38 expression. 
Um, so I think they're two separate things. I don't think we will change the therapy with the anti-CD38 uh, in either direction, um, uh, depending on the uh, circulating tumor cells. Thank you, sir. Sir, do you want to leave or should we go ahead? Because one more discussion wants to ask a question to you, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Sanyal, your question, please. Dr. Sanyal, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to speak case. The gentleman I diagnosed with a multiple myeloma in 2017, given four cycle of VRD and then transplanted that point of time and then put on the lane maintenance. So just four or five months back, uh, there is a sudden cytopenia. I initially thought it was a lane induced. I stopped the lane, but nothing improved. So I did the marrow and I got a diagnosis at MDS 321 translocation. So I assumed it was MDS related to the lane itself. Then we given three cycle of the azacitidine. And at present, he underwent uh, just a few days back, mud in, uh, 12 by 12 uh, female transplantation. So he's still in the unit, count is recovering, day 14 now. So my question that, and with, uh, and in the last four or five years, his myeloma is very well controlled. Couple under issue was normal, M band was negative. And before transplant also, when we did the marrow, that there's no plasma cells, nothing was there. MRD was negative from the plasma cell point of view. So my question that post-transplant, when shall I follow the patient? Shall I just forget the myeloma or keep in the myeloma is still in my mind? I think you should still continue to follow the myeloma uh, because you know, it's a high likely possibility that it might relapse at some point. So I used uh, blue male ATG consolidation mm -hmm. conditioning at this stage. So I just do the same thing three, four months. The light change. Yeah. Just continue to follow. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. So I think we have finished, sir, all the questions from the discussions. Uh, there are no more raising signs. Any discussion want to ask any other question? Okay, sir. Agarwal, sir. Vote of thank. <laughs> Go ahead. Amit. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have finished all the questions from the audience and from the discussions. So, thank you so much for the fabulous and fantastic lecture and what a lovely discussion. Always good to hear from you and what a great learning from you, sir. Always. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. This Saturday evening for us and morning for us. Thank you so much once again. Thank sir. you. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing everyone. Take care. Thank you.